Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 348, featuring the first installment of my interview with Mr. Stephen Kick, the CEO and founder of Night Dive Studios. Now in this first installment, we talk about uh, the mission of Night Dive Studios, uh, Stephen's commitment and passion for preserving video game history, and some uh, fun, uh, fun little anecdotes that he tells about working with people like Harlan Ellison and Warren Spector, and uh, much more. Uh, however, I just want to say that if, uh, if you're watching this video, just because you're interested in the System Shock remake that they've kickstarted, uh, you might want to wait and come back uh, for the next installment, which will be posted in, in, posted in a few days. And in that segment, we'll really focus in on the uh, System Shock remake, and there's a whole bunch of uh, questions about it. So, uh, and this episode is more general about Night Dive Studios and about what makes that System Shock game uh, worth remaking in the first place. So, uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, uh, I think we've got a lot of great stuff here. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Stephen Kick. Hi folks, I am here with Stephen Kick, the CEO and founder of Night Dive Studios. That's a name you've probably come across if you've been on Steam or GOG looking at the classic games there. They have updated a lot of them, uh, re-released them for modern systems. I was looking at some of the, it's a pretty huge list, some 90 games uh, they've, they've worked on. Uh, let's see, Wizardry 6 through 8, 7th Guest, uh, Darklands, that's one of the favorites around here. Uh, I saw you had Bad Mojo on there, and then about 80 Putt-Putt games. <laughs> uh, maybe not quite 80, but there's like at least 30. <laughs> Those Putt-Putt games, they don't, they don't get enough uh, attention, I think. It's a, I had the Fat Man on, and he was going on about, I think it's Putt-Putt Plays Golf, or no, uh, Putt-Putt Goes to the Zoo that had the first music video. Yeah, the Fat Man also did the music for Bad Mojo, if oh, I'm really? not mistaken. I, I know he did Seventh Guest. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. That was a scary game, Bad Mojo. Man, I don't think a game has disturbed me that much. Uh, it wasn't the dead, the dead, the dead rat that tries to claw you when you're walking past. Oh yeah, it, like will kind of like suck you into its mouth, and there's like all congealed blood and stuff on this greasy floor. You don't think it's gonna, you know, <laughs> move, but it'll get you. Man, that game gets under your skin. All right, before we get into the Kickstarter, I wanted to talk a little bit about you, Stephen. Uh, so you started off uh, as a character artist, doing artwork for Planet Side 2, a bunch of other games. And then you uh, met up with uh, Larry Cooperman and, and hired him on, right? That's correct, yeah. So what made you want to go from this nice job as a character artist to <laughs> CEO? Um, well, I think a lot of the people that you know pursue a job in the game industry, they ultimately have this you know this dream of of kind of running their own studio making their own games uh Tighten doing what graphics on level three and all that. yeah doing what they want and um so it got to a point where i just got kind of burned out working on somebody else's games and decided to kind of do my own thing and um i didn't get into night dive right off the bat what i did first is i quit my job, and then uh, traveled through Mexico and Central America for about a year. Um, we Just actually for fun, I, or were you on some kind of expedition? Yeah, I mean, you could like call Steve it... Steve Jobs, like, uh, walk walkabout? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just... we, we My wife and I, uh, who also worked at Sony as a character artist, she, uh, she planned the whole thing out. We got in our 99 Honda Civic and just drove across the border one day into Tijuana, uh, all the way down the Baja Peninsula, and then all the way across... Uh, Mexico, um, you know, down through Belize, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, um, all the way to the Panama Canal. And then we drove all the way back home. And uh, during that time, we had a little netbook. And what I did is I loaded it up with classic PC games because, you know, it was That's what you my chance. That yeah. <laughs> it was my chance to kind of revisit uh, the games that initially inspired me to want to become, you know, a game developer. And um, I was playing uh, Grim Fandango, Full Throttle, Curse of Monkey Island, uh, Fallout 2. Um, and wow. yeah, I, just, I got to uh, System Shock 2 and I couldn't get the damn thing to run. So I started. No problems going with to, any of those other games, but System Shock. Yeah. Uh, so I went to GOG.com to, to buy the game legally, you know, to get a working version, and I discovered that it wasn't available. Um, but at the same time, it was like the most requested type. You know, it had like 40,000 like wishes or something. Copyright limbo, right? Yeah, so um, it 
gave me uh, an opportunity to kind of go out and see what was going on with this. I know, you know, through my research, other people had kind of tried to unravel the the rights and everything like that and um, didn't really have that much luck or something had gone in their way. And, um, I mean, long story short, uh, we managed to get the rights of System Shock 2 and re-release it and, um, you know, founded Night Dive based off of the success of that and then started going out and getting other games that were no longer available for one reason or another. What sort of criteria do you use when you're trying to find the games that you want to to update? Because, I mean, System Shock 2 and Putt-Putt, you, know? <laughs> uh, you seem very eclectic. Well, um, you know, when I was a kid, I really didn't have... Uh, there, I didn't have any consoles, for one thing, to begin with. They weren't allowed in the house. And so when we oh, got our wow. first... No, it was not. Nintendo was not a thing that uh, we did not have. Um, spent a lot of sleepovers at other friends' house, of course, who had Nintendo. But um, so basically, when we got our first computer, I went and I I bought everything that I could. I tried uh, games from every genre, um, every age group, of course. Um, you know, I had Quake Two installed on my computer the same time I was playing Spy Fox. Um, it was just you know. So they were okay with it. Quakes and Dooms and all that, but just no no Nintendo? <laughs> well, <laughs> they actually, my parents were not okay with uh, M-rated games up until I was about, I don't know, maybe like 14 years old. I'm pretty, mu- I'm uh, pretty sure mine still forbid it, but... Yeah, they were, uh, my parents were strict in terms of like um, that kind of content. Like I remember them checking the parental advisory labels on CDs that I bought and then like listening to the CDs and screening them and uh, man, that used to just really upset me back then. But maybe it did some good. I don't know. There's no way to tell. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah. So the criteria for selecting the games. I mean, Ron Gilbert worked on a lot of the Humongous games. Um, that was his company, Humongous, after he left Lucas Arts. And um, I I played those games growing up, and I knew how good they were. There's a lot of um, adult humor kind of mixed in, so that you know if you're playing with your children, it's not just like a mundane experience. It's also you're also having fun. And um, yeah, I try not to um, like pick and choose. Like I know that some games are going to do better than others. You know, commercially, we're going to you know make more on our return, and it's going to help our business. But at the same time. I feel like every game deserves the opportunity to come back. And if it's within, um, you know, our kind of financial parameters, like if I have the extra funds to go out and get something that I know is going to only make me and maybe like two other people happy, I'll do it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of our games like that. Like um, uh, Time Lapse is a, is a more recent one, which was an adventure game that I really loved growing up. Um, but, uh, it's a title that I don't know of anybody else who's ever played it, but we went out and got it because um, you know these these games they're they're our history, and um, if we lose that, then you know we don't have the same advantage as other mediums. Artistic mediums have like film and and uh, traditional art. Amen to that. You're really fighting the good fight, Stephen. I want to question i have kind of related to this you know what what kind of relationship do you have with these abandoned wear types you know do they, are they like your arch nemeses or are you okay <laughs> i mean what do they do you get complaints from people that are used to getting these games uh unauthorized and now they are sent to gog or whatever um not really we have a really good relationship with some of the larger um abandoned wear sites um if they're giving away something that you know we're about to sell, we'll, we'll politely ask them to take it down. Um, we, of course, know that uh, nothing's going to stop BitTorrent. Nothing's going to stop people from going to the Pirate Bay and downloading the game if they really want to save you know, five bucks. It's like our typical, you know, our average price point for a lot of our games. And um, you know, I used to be like that. I, you know, back when I was a kid, if I couldn't afford a game and you know, we got our cable internet you know installed i would go out and i would just i would pirate it and uh, i am shocked yeah Ooh. <laughs> you like that uh, floppy disk box full of like the marker marked up discs yeah Dark well seed. man i could i could really get into it i was a i was a bad kid i was very industrious but um 
I was like the first one, you know, I went out and I like mowed lawns and I bought things like uh, blank CDs, uh, CDRWs, um, video cards, whatever. And I would pirate things, pirate games, and I'd go to school and I would sell them to kids because <laughs> you know, why not? Bad pirates. <laughs> Super bad. I mean, we're talking bootleg, you know, uh, like 15 years ago or more. But um, you know, once I, so this is my saving thing is like, once I got expendable income, I went and I, and I bought, you know, everything that I had, I had taken and I enjoyed because, um, I understand like there were, there, there are kids like me and there are people that just don't have the means to afford it. And it's like, there's no, there's no way to stop them. And the great thing with, um, working with a digital media is that it doesn't hurt us, um, the people that are going to pirate this stuff aren't going to be the people that are going to buy it anyways. And your best bet is to make a great product and maybe try to convince them with that product and with the quality of it that, you know, maybe if they do have some money, they'll buy one of your future products. Um, we had a lot of talks about DRM and stuff like that when I was working at Sony. And it was like, guys, you're just hurting the consumer. All you're doing is pissing them off and they're not going to want to buy your product. Meanwhile, the pirates are just going to rip that stuff out anyways and they're going to have the pure experience that you know you should be providing to your paying customer, and that just like mentality just did not get through to anybody. Um, it seems, and um, yeah, again, another long-winded answer to to one of your questions. But um, yeah, we have a good relationship with the pirates or with the people that host our stuff for free, and I just don't want to step on anyone's toes because you know, and it doesn't matter; it doesn't hurt us. Yeah, I think. You know, I was just thinking about how you said that your games are maybe five bucks. Some of these old, old classics, and I mean, really, you gotta. I hear people say, "Yeah, I don't want to spend the five bucks," but you gotta consider the time it's going to take to get that running, and then who knows if you could trust that download, what what else might be embedded in that, right? And then right, you might yeah. not have the manual there. So I just, I think it's a lot. To me, I'd much rather pay the money, <laughs> not have to deal. And I mean, some of the does any of the money end up in the going to the original creators or is there anything like that um sometimes uh basically if the original creators if they're the ones that hold the license then you know the majority of the of the money that we make off that goes back to them but sometimes um like with system shock the original creators didn't have any of the rights it was owned by an insurance company in the midwest <laughs> insurance it was actually company. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, most of the the funds went back to them. But the reason that they had the um, the rights to begin with is because Looking Glass defaulted on some loans. So they were just trying to make the money back that was owed to them initially um, by, you know, uh, allowing the redistribution of the game. So yeah, in a perfect world, I would love to like, you know, make sure that some of the original creators got you know some funds and everything like that but maybe we can work something out in the future i'm not sure i mean at the very least having their having the games come back out in their name out there again you know that's got to be good for their careers right yeah i would think so i mean these people they spent years and years working on something that um you know represented a lot of their time and their passion and their skill and and to have that not be available for people to enjoy anymore i think that's almost worse so just a couple little things here yeah, maybe I'll just skip on to the. <laughs> you can I'm very ask tempted. You want. That I am very a uh, couple things I noticed in some of your other interviews. I was really <laughs> curious about this. Sure. Uh, this phone call from Harlan Ellison. Wow. <laughs> that yeah. is that was a trip, huh? Yeah, I um he's called me on a number of occasions since oh, a number we started. of occasions. Wow. Yeah, since we started um, reselling, I have no mouth, and he's like the nicest guy. He doesn't charge you to talk to you on the phone. No, absolutely not. <laughs> He's he is just um, I don't know how to put it. I I just I enjoy talking to him, and he's he's really thrilled that uh, people are playing the game and they're reading the book, and um, that somebody was interested in in kind of doing this for him. Um, he's been a fantastic partner for us. I just remember watching his little doc, little mini doc. What do you, what do you call those things? Uh, Remember watching him on the Sci Fi Channel? He had those little diatribes, I guess. He'd go after Star Trek. Or <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> why? Um, he got so mad that people wanted to interview him and wouldn't pay him. 
<laughs> yeah, that was one of the surprising things is because, um, you know, when I reached out to his agent uh, to see about the rights, just to ask about them. Um, We're talking about the, uh, what is the, I have no mouth and I must scream. Is that there? Yeah. I think I'm, is that the right thing? <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in the ballpark. But is <laughs> yeah. Um, and and uh, basically he was saying, oh, yeah, um, Harlan has the rights. I'll put you in touch with him. I was like, oh, shit, because I've heard, you know, I've read about him and I've read his stories and I kind of know, um, you know, the general feelings about, um, you know, he's he was supposedly very onerous, right? Just kind of cranky and, and not very polite. But um, so, like, I read up on him and and tried to get a better picture of him. And of course, when he calls me up, he's like, Hey, Steven, it's great to be talking to you. And I'm, it took me completely off guard. So he's, maybe he's changed. And of course, uh, you're also a big uh, Giger fan. Now, see that, have you, uh, I got a note here about Dark Seed. Did you have Dark Seed? Or are you still working on getting Dark Seed? Um, we got very close to working out a deal. Um, right before he, uh, unfortunately, before he passed away, and it kind of put a lot of our, um, obviously, our discussions on hold. Um, we weren't gonna, you know, push, <laughs> push the fact after after he, after he died. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just been kind of one of those things that's just been on the back, uh, the back burner ever since. Um, but it might be something we revisit in the future. Um. Dark Seed One is something that we could we could put up and running re- relatively quickly, but uh, the issue with Dark Seed Two and this kind of fell into the whole conversation about um, you know licensing the titles was that it required Windows Three Point One to run, and the only way to um, package that currently is by including a copy of Three Point One, the operating system, with the wow. docs box executable so what would actually happen is you'd start the game and it would boot windows 3.1 and then run the game inside that um and that currently was the only way to get that running uh so we talked to microsoft and windows 3.1 still isn't open source and free to use it's still a commercial product Jeez. and uh so that pretty much cut um our ability to do anything with that title Not a lot of fun with the original dark seed on the added on the amiga Oh yeah, that's a man. That game is just—it's one of those it ones that just will, me. yeah, it'll just stick with you forever. The music and oh, it was wonderful. All right, so let's talk then about the System Shock uh, remake that you're working on, and uh, we don't want people to get confused because you've already done this System Shock Enhanced Edition uh, last year back in December, right? And I was—I uh, mean, that to me is a very impressive product. You know, I started this morning, I was playing uh, the classic, and then I switched to the enhanced edition, and <laughs> whoa, never going back uh, to that original. I guess that's probably uh, sacrilegious on, on some level, but who cares, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I guess that's been a pretty successful product. <clears throat> Would you say that kind of reinvigorated uh, reinvigorated interest in the franchise? It definitely did. Um, more so, it reinvigorated our interest um, as a team to use this as um, our opportunity to remake uh, to remake the game and because um, as good as the enhanced edition is you know with the mouse support and uh, you know slightly higher resolution support um, it just left us wanting a lot more uh, being able to experience it in that way uh, really kind of showed us the potential that it had um, in the form of a remake where, you know, all the mechanics, uh, for the most part, really hold up and haven't been revisited a lot in contemporary games. And so we saw that and um, basically from, you know, the date that we released it, we started planning uh, a remake and started working on the prototype, which eventually became the free-to-play demo that we released with uh, our Kickstarter and that demo, that's another mind-blowing experience. You know, if you're watching this, uh, I suggest you play the classic System Shock for a while, then go to the Enhanced Edition, play that a little while, and that'll blow you away. And then play the uh, this demo. <laughs> wow, uh, that is uh, extraordinary. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the the original game, the original System Shock. 
I guess uh, probably more people played the second one than the first one. I'm not sure how widespread the, the first one was, but it, you know, it's quite a unique game, I, I would say. Uh, I was wondering if you could compare it a little bit here for games people uh, might be more familiar with, say Doom or Quake. Yeah, that's. I think that's uh, one of the main reasons um, it never really kind of found itself in our, you know, gamer lexicon, is because when System Shock One came out, it was competing with the likes of Doom Two. Hey, good luck with that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, basically anything that came out with a first-person perspective post Doom was a Doom clone, and generally. Uh, didn't get any kind of attention or um, recognition, uh, regardless of how different it may have ended up being, uh, you know, from the core Doom experience. And so when um, when Shock One first came out, it was only available on floppy, and they were not able to fit all the um, all the sounds or the voiceovers into that version, and um, the experience ended up being, you know. What I would guess back then would have been, you know, subpar, and um, it didn't really hold up to, you know, the fast-paced action of Doom and its various clones, and so it kind of got buried beneath that for a while. Um, fortunately, the CD-ROM version came out not too long later, that introduced, you know, the voiceovers and some of the more um, high-resolution art and that type of thing. Um, but by that time, it was a little too late. Um, What's really sad about that is that uh, System Shock was, you know, the first, I want to say it was the first true 3D uh, first-person experience where there was, you know, 3D models and it wasn't just um, sprites kind of making up the bulk of the game. And uh, not only that, but it was the first, you know, first-person shooter to really have this, uh, this narrative driving the story through audio logs and text that you find throughout the game. Um, and not only that, but it wasn't linear. Um, you'd have to go back to certain areas. Um, you'd have to, you know, retread your steps. And um, it was vastly more complex than anything else on the market, which, you know, at one point, it, it's, it was way ahead of its time. And uh, unfortunately, I think that was its kind of its major undoing at that point. I know a lot of people tell me they... What they like about it was the the sophistication of it and the complexity of it. Which you know, I had when I had John Romero, I talked to him about Doom and uh, maybe even uh, with the uh, Wolfenstein. But I remember he was saying that it re- they had the, all these plans for all this extra features and things, and they decided to rip it all out because they mm-hmm. <laughs> just wanted that adrenaline rush experience. And uh, you can really see. I mean, if, if you play as Shock One. It's, it's hard. I mean, yeah, it's first person, okay, but <laughs> it's so the experience is completely different, you know, than uh, Doom or Quake, at, at least to me. Yeah, you can't just run in and start, you know, going guns blazing. I mean, this is a game you got to read the manual. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's like a two hundred page manual that you really should sit down and read. Well, I mean, before that, even it's like you have to. You know, the, the start screen, it's got this massive information just thrown at you with the, with the user interface. It's like there's those little red boxes everywhere that says, this is this, this is that. <laughs> this is how you do all these things. And it's like the game hasn't even started yet. And you're just overwhelmed from the get-go. Um, but yeah, that's, I remember reading in uh, Masters of Doom about all their plans that they had uh, for Doom specifically, like... You know, there was going to be this really deep story, and there were going to be these characters you could talk to, and um, all this stuff. And uh, there was a, a Bible that was written, like a Doom Bible, that had all this stuff outlined. That um, I don't remember specifically which team member it was at ID, but you know, they had spent the majority of production, you know, working on it as like a guideline. And of course, you know, John Romero was like, "Okay, well, we're doing this. Just throw that out." And that, you know. <laughs> It must have been kind of frustrating, but um, you know, maybe maybe Doom would have ended up kind of in the in the same position as System Shock had they not kind of focused uh, their development in one area. Well, you know, some people like the actually prefer it to Doom for the, those very reasons, right? They want a deeper. I'd almost say more like a. It almost plays sometimes more like a complex simulator 
mm-hmm. type of game than just a run and gun and you know jump scare. Although it's pretty scary too, but it's a different kind of uh, scary, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, System Shock be referred to as a thinking man's doom. A thinking man's <laughs> doom. <laughs> I don't know how Romero would take that. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, my apologies again if you wanted to know more about the uh, System Shock remake. But again, let me remind you, we're really going to go into detail on that in the next show, which will be in just a few days. So uh, just be patient. Hang in there. Uh, hopefully we'll cover all the bases, everything you wanted to know uh, about that remake. But I thought this uh, stuff in this part was interesting, too. <laughs> hopefully you did as well. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You're keeping these episodes coming. Uh, Remember, if you want to join the Matt Chat Rats, if you will, uh, just go to that Patreon link in the show notes. You can go to mattchat.us, and there's PayPal there. There's GOG, all kinds of ways to support the show. Uh, If you can't afford to support the show, though, don't feel bad. Just tell somebody about it on Facebook or Twitter. And that, I appreciate everything you guys do to support uh, this show, so thank you very, very much. All right, so what about that news from the Matt Cave? I got a couple of uh, fun items here. This first one is from Stig. I guess I should start calling him the <laughs> the Matt Chat reporter. Uh, so he wrote in about this uh, little mini Nintendo. Uh, so Nintendo is releasing this miniature NES. Uh, it's got 30 built-in games. Uh, that's kind of key. So if you were expecting to be able to plug in uh, your old Nintendo cartridges, uh, you won't be able to do that. Uh, so that's bad. Uh, but on the positive side, it does have some kind of save point system. I forget what they call that, but it sounds like you can uh, save uh, the state of the, uh, the machine. And also, I thought this was cool, you can use the controller that comes with it with your Wii remote so you can play those virtual console games with something uh, more like an original NES controller. And it's only 60 bucks, you know, so. Uh, I'd say the only real negative there, I, I wish you could play with the original cartridges. But, uh, you know, for what it is, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, also, I just happened to notice this. This was on Indie Retro News this morning. Uh, Fallout 1.5 Resurrection. Uh, this is a complete new story for Fallout 2. Apparently, it's been out for a while. I think it was uh, might have been Czech. I didn't write that down. But anyway, now there's an English version of it, which is awesome. Uh, you do need to have Fallout 2 installed before you can play this, but it's got new areas, characters, and lots of uh, quests with multiple quest solutions. Uh, so anyway, this just looks really great. I haven't got a chance to play it play it yet, but uh, I think you guys will be interested in this. And, uh, if you are familiar with it, please let me know uh, what it's like, what your impressions are, at least. <laughs> I'd love to know more. Also, a special shout-out to Nathan and Becca. Uh, they're long-term uh, friends and fans of the, of the show, as well as just personal friends. Uh, they came down, or came up, rather, uh, to visit recently, and they came bearing gifts, uh, namely this uh, Amiga 4000 and Macintosh Forma two awesome machines, and I really wanted to uh, thank them for that. Looking forward to many great hours spent uh, playing and computing on these vintage machines. So thank you very much, Nathan and Becca. Uh, What about that ale of the week? Uh, This week I've got a little number here called the Wild Ride India Pale Ale. Got a nice hop right there on the label. Sand Creek Brewing Company out of Black River Falls, Wisconsin. So just just down the road, let's see, Sand Creek Brewing Company, Sand Creek, <laughs> Sand Creek Brewing Company, do you give me any information about your ale? You do not. So I don't know what the alcohol content is, but we do know it's from Wisconsin. Maybe, it's like, maybe it's got so much alcohol in it they forgot to put that on the label when they were designing it. But uh, anyway, let's get this, uh, this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this wild ride here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I gotta say, uh, when I opened the bottle, the stuff started uh, shooting out of it, so maybe your wild ride will be to the carpet cleaner. Let's hope not. 
Uh, smell wise, uh, you can definitely smell the hops in this. Not a big surprise given it's an IPA. A little bit of caramel, a little bit of a nutty like uh, aroma to it, but not a whole lot going on. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's definitely not overpowering in terms of uh, aroma, so let's give it a taste. Uh, uh, taste wise, I'm going to say right off the bat, it's very smooth for an IPA. Uh, some of these can get really bitter uh, in a hurry, but this one is actually very uh, mild tasting. Uh, you definitely do taste some hops though, a little bit of bitterness, uh, some kind of caramel, a sort of a toasted uh, toasted malt flavor. Actually uh, quite nice. I'll try it again here. I mean, it's, it's, I think this is a, if you uh, don't normally go for IPAs because you think they're a little too much flavor, a little too uh, strong for you, uh, this might be a good choice. Uh, however, I think most people that go for IPAs probably do uh, want something that will uh, really sort of overwhelm the, the senses. Uh, this one though, uh, definitely on the milder side. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, so I guess if you want something mild, something drinkable, uh, with just a kind of a little bit of a hint of that hoppy, bitter nature of an IPA, this would be a good choice. Uh, but again, if you want something that's really uh, strong, you probably should move on. Uh, they didn't say how much alcohol was in this. Uh, but I'm guessing somewhere between maybe five and six, maybe as much as six and a half, but I think it's probably closer to five and a half, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, but anyway, it is very uh, nice and tasty, so I'm going to go uh, yeah, maybe two out of five, somewhere between two and three out of five drinking horns on this Wild Ride India Pale Ale. Uh, not bad, but, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of better, <laughs> there's many better IPAs out there uh, than this one. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. I'm going to go back to uh, the gunny here for a quote selection. Uh, he's got one here from Bobby Fisher, chess champion. And I thought this was a really good, really good quotation, so I want to share it with you. It goes something like this. It's not the first mistake that kills you. It's the second mistake that you make because you're still thinking about the first mistake. <laughs> See you guys next week.